Welcome to Crosswords, the podcast about practical Christianity. What does it look like to walk in Jesus' footsteps? How do I live in a culture hostile to godliness? These are questions that we'll answer on each podcast as we get our heart and mind on Jesus. All scriptures quoted are from the New International Version. You can follow me on Twitter at Kingdom underscore Saint. Walk with the Lord today and be a blessing. You know, whenever there's a competition, whenever we set ourselves to play some kind of a game, it's usually timed. Uh, People work really hard during the time allotted for a particular game. They know what they have to do. But when that time is over, when the time is over for that competition or for that game, they stop worrying about what they had to do and what their responsibilities were during the time allotted. That's automatic. There's no more concern. For me, if I am a tight end in a football team after the game is over, I don't have to be so concerned about it anymore because the game is over. You might not think that we are living in a competition right now, but since the moment that you were born, somebody started a timer. You're on borrowed time. We are concerned now about bills, jobs, education, clothing, eating, and the like. We make schedules, we make appointments, we make reminders and plans. If someone says to us, okay, Time's up. What would you think? What would you do if all of a sudden, at this moment, time is no more? Think about the things that you are concerned for the most part. They all have to do with the time that you're keeping in your life currently right now. Maybe some of you are thinking, okay, tomorrow I got to make sure I pay that bill. or I got to make an appointment that changed my oil in the car and, and so on and on. You have a series of timed events that are going to carry you through the next week. That is, if you have any responsibilities. And so this sometimes makes us real anxious. We're on somebody's time, on somebody's clock. We have to punch in. When do we punch out of this life? Well, for some, uh, you might feeling like you're already punching out. (laughs) You might be facing retirement on account of age or health, all of a sudden, now you're gonna be out of this rat race. Some rejoice over this day, some are looking forward to this day. But does that mean that time is no more? No, maybe not time at your job, but you still have time in your life. You might be out of the rat race, but for some others, retirement eh, is not a good thing to look forward to. It means the end of days and we all will face retirement one day, won't we? Not from our jobs, but from this life. I like the way Moses put it here in Psalm 90, verse 7 through 12. He says, we're consumed by your anger, terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under you, your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow for they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In this prayer slash journal entry that Moses makes here in this psalm. He acknowledges that all of us, all of us human beings, we're like, we're like pieces of paper in front of a great fire. We can't stand it. We won't be able to stand God's anger. We're set to be consumed by the wrath of God. Moses acknowledged that because he was self-aware as Mike brought up in his lesson. He knew what he was. He knew that in our sins, we had aroused the wrath and the anger of God. Who can stand on that day when God comes and his wrath is going to consume? I certainly won't be able to stand 
before him in this flesh because I'll be like a piece of paper. Throw a piece of paper in the fireplace, what's going to happen? What's going to be consumed right away? And that's what we are. It is no mystery that God is angry. You know, in the same way that your wrath sometimes is aroused when you look at things that happen in the world and you think, how can this happen? How can we stand by and let things like these happen? If it arouses your wrath, think about how much more it arouses the wrath of God. He is angry, yes. He is angry. But Moses, he prays for understanding in light of God's wrath. He doesn't cower away in fear, even though he knows he cannot stand before the great consuming wrath of God. He doesn't cower with fear. He just prays to God. He says, teach me. I want to know how to number my days. Give me some understanding so that this little pitiful life that I'm living here can mean something and can stand for something good, even though I know that I am not. So he prays for understanding and how to number our days. This is a very wise thing to do, brothers and sisters, because oftentimes we allow somebody else's schedule, somebody else's timing to rule us and to move us about. And that's when we get filled with anxiety about the kind of life we live here. You know, somebody else, they say, I must do this. And that's what all the commercials aim to do, right? Oh, you need to get this. No, you need to get that. Oh, you need to take this drug. No, you need to do that thing. And we're like, oh, I got to make, and we get all anxious and upset and kind of bullied by all these different things. And Moses says, no, 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 no. What we need is understanding to know how to number our days because they're limited. And so I want to make the most of them. Moses says here that there's something that we can do while we're here, even if our existence here, as he says, is filled with moaning, <laughs> sorrow, even though the best of the years here might amount to trouble. As the song just said, trouble don't last always, so that's a good thing, right? We have something to look forward to, something that can give us hope. And that is the hope that comes from the gospel. There are some songs that I like to remind myself whenever I get anxious or whenever I feel bullied by some kind of time constraint or, or schedule. I like to remember this song. In the resurrection morning when the trump of God shall sound. That's what I'm looking forward to. I will rise, amen? Not by my own strength, but because God has given me hope. That's what I'm looking forward to. I will rise, we shall rise, and sing hallelujah. No tears will ever be found, we shall rise. That's the hope that we have. We're not gonna be consumed if we've chosen Christ, but we need to make sure we're living the rest of these days with understanding so we don't get consumed by anxiety either. I also like to remember this other song, Prime Time. How many of you know this one? One of my favorite songs, uh, Keith Lancaster's album, Prime Time, back in the 90s. Notice, notice what it says. It says, I'm waiting for the prime. I'm not going to sing it for you because I know I'll mess it up. I'm waiting for the prime time. Moving to the other shore. We're headed for the prime time. Singing there forevermore. There'll be nothing like the prime time. Because that's what we've been living for. Prime time. When time is no more. Too often, what do we call prime time here? <laughs> A certain time in the afternoon when... Uh, TV producers can charge more for their commercials because more people will be sitting in front of the TV. Although I don't know if that's true for today because now with the internet, prime time is any time. <laughs> but we're looking forward to the real prime time. And that's going to be when time is no more. When you will no longer be constrained by a time, by a ticking clock 
Every day I look in the mirror. It's a day we get a little older. It's a day we get a little closer to retirement. A day we get a little closer to health issues. Something's going to happen in this timeline that we're in. I'm looking forward to when time is no more. But I have to live the rest of these days in wisdom and understanding. Time hasn't stopped yet. My clock is still ticking. So we're still accountable. Somebody is still refereeing us here in this life. What is it? What is expected of us until that day? How do we number our days in wisdom as Moses asked? How do we do that? How are we judged? We do a lot of things. We worry about a lot of things. I like to go by what Jesus told Martha in Luke 10, 42. Only one thing is needed. That brings my anxiety level down. I'm only accountable to Jesus. So let's look at what Jesus says that he needed. John 4, 34 through 38. Jesus says here, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus knew his days were numbered, probably better than anyone else here. He knew exactly how many days he had from the get-go. And so he set about to make sure that the work his father wanted him to do was finished. And so he says here, I've got work to do. I have to finish his work. That was his concern. Then he says something interesting. He says, don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes. Look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Jesus says, thus the saying one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. He's encouraging us to open our eyes and to realize and to understand that there is a work to be done. Moses asked, give me understanding so I can know how to number the days of my life. Jesus says, open your eyes and see that the work is there already. The fields are ripe for this harvest. This is the harvest, the work that God calls us to do. Here in John 5, 17, uh, Jesus defended himself against some Pharisees by saying, my father is always at his, at his work to this very day and I too am working. So we know what Jesus' work was. He had a specific work to do, which we'll detail in a little bit. But what about us? What is the work the Father wants us to do? Does the Bible, is the Bible clear about what God expects from us? And I found this passage in 1 Corinthians 3, 5 to 8 that's very similar to the work Jesus says he had. But this time, it's applied to us. And speaking to the Corinthians, Paul writes, What after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. What are those tasks? Paul says, I planted, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So the one who plants or the one who waters is anything. But only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. And they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. So we can see here the Bible describes our task or what the Lord expects for us to do. As either a planter or a waterer. Which one do you consider yourself to be? Paul said, I'm a planter. And he described Apollos as a waterer. Well, what is that? Planting involves planting a seed. Which seed? We have many parables that illustrate what is the seed that we're planting. What was the seed that was planted in us? The seed of the gospel. The seed is the word of God. 
the gospel. From the parable of the sower, we know that there are four different types of soils depending on how they react to the seed. So planting involves sharing the gospel, teaching the Bible, speaking the words of God to a soul who is not a disciple of Jesus. And what is watering then? Well, watering occurs after you've planted a seed. So if I planted a seed in somebody and then I keep encouraging them and talking to them about the gospel, encouraging them perhaps to obey the gospel, what am I doing? I'm watering the seed. So sometimes you could be doing both. But honestly, some of us are better planters. You know, we got that networking thing going on. We know a lot of people. We might be a little charismatic. People like us and they smile. I don't know. Some of us have that facility. I know I don't have it. They react well to you. So you could be a good planter. I tend to see myself as a waterer. You know, after you've put the seed in there, I'll come. And I'll throw a little water in there. Shh. I think I do that better. Some of you are great planters. Some of you are great water. Some of you are great doing both. Honestly, you can do both. Plant and water. This is something that we can do, brothers and sisters. And not only we can do, but we should do while we're here. This is how we number our days with, with wisdom, I believe. Because think about it. Jesus knew his days were numbered. And what did he focus on? The task that his father wanted him to finish. So if I'm going to be walking in the footsteps of Jesus and I want to number my days in wisdom, what should I do? Shouldn't I imitate Jesus and then focus then on the task the Father has given me? I think that's how we number our days in wisdom. Because in doing so, not only as the messages in our lips and in our mind, we're keeping ourselves in that repentance mode that Michael was talking about. And we're helping other people also approach God. And I think that makes me more mindful even about why I'm here and what I, why I do what I do. And not get caught up in all the drama, all the excess and unnecessary drama that the world brings. With their timetables and schedules and all kinds of things that oftentimes we have to subject ourselves to. No, I have only one timetable. That's God's timetable. And what does God want me to do? He wants me to be a planter and a waterer. These are the tasks handed to us. Remember the parable of the talent, Matthew 25, 14 through, thir uh, through 13. I want to take a little moment to actually read some of it. So if you want to turn with me uh, to that passage in your Bibles. If you like this podcast, please show your support by clicking on the support link on my Anchor FM profile. You will find the link listed in the description of the podcast on your favorite podcast app. With your support, I will continue to produce authentic Christian content as the Lord allows me to do. Matthew 25, 14 through 30. This parable is an illustration of this concept that I'm sharing with you. How to number our days in wisdom. How to be that planter and that waterer. Jesus says here, again, it, and when he says it, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Because these are parables about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey. Who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Funny that this last Friday, we were just talking about that, weren't we? How God entrusts his wealth to us. But if God gives us stuff, gives us things, gives us talents, however, which way you want to see it, well, he certainly will expect us to use it. And that's precisely what happens. Verse 15, to one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, to another one bag, each according to his ability. Sometimes we allow greed to get the best of us. And we're like, hey, he got more than I did. I want, I want what that guy had. <laughs> I want to have what he has. And, and we lose sight 
why he has it, and why I've been given something else. That's why we need to guard ourselves against all kinds of greed. Because God doesn't give us these things to hoard them up. There's a purpose to why maybe he gave you two and me one. Maybe you're a better manager than I am. Maybe you're more generous and will share more. I'm more greedy, so he only gave me one. But I can still do my job. I can still do what he expects me to do with that bag of gold he gave me. So then he went on his journey. Verse 16 says, The man who received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work. And he gained five more. Wow, that guy was a good planter and waterer. So also the man with two bags of gold, he gained two more. But the man who received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. So he kept it all to himself. He didn't want to multiply it. He didn't want to put it to work. But there was a thought behind that. After a long time, the master of those servants returned, settled accounts with them. That's judgment day. God has given us his wealth and he has distributed to everyone according to their ability. And there's an expectation that he puts on each and every one of you to do something with it. And there will be one day when he says that he is going to settle accounts. That's when time will stop. That's when the punch clock is punched. That's when the stopwatch stops. That's when Jesus will say, time's up. Put your pencils down. Have you been working for that day? To one he said, the man who received five goals, five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold? See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done. Good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. See, even though this guy had received the most, the master said, it's still a few. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. That's the goal right here, to share in our master's happiness. That's what God wants. The man with two bags also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two. I've gained two more. And Jesus, notice how Jesus didn't judge him for only having two instead of five, which <laughs> gives me a great deal of comfort, to be honest with you. You know, I'm a, sometimes I may be an A-type personality, and I want to get 10 bags of gold. But I'm glad that if all I was able to muster up was two, Jesus is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Whoa. He's not going to say, yeah, you were not as good, but come in anyway. No, <laughs> he's going to say, hey, you did what I expected you to do. And that's fine. We can't expect the hammer to screw in a screw, can we? Neither does God expect someone whom he gave two to produce ten. Each according to his ability. But look what happened to the guy who had one bag. In verse 24, then the man who had received one bag of gold came, Master, he said, I knew you were a hard man. You're a hard man. Harvesting where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. I think that these are the people that say, God, how come I don't have this? God, I want this. God, I want that. God, take me out of here. God, God, complaining, complaining, no gratitude, no thankfulness. Ordering God around. God is hard. God is not, you know, he doesn't judge right. All these kinds of thoughts. You're a hard man. Harvesting where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. These are people who don't see the love of God. All they have is fear before their eyes. And so God settles account and says in verse 26, you wicked, lazy servant. You're just lazy. They lazy and wicked. You judge me like this. Verse 27 he says, well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers. 
And then, of course, that guy didn't have a good end. You can read all about it in verse 29 and 30. It wasn't a good end for that guy. You know, that day when the master returns, he's going to settle accounts. But we have to have wisdom about how to number our days. And I believe this parable gives us a few points on how to gain some wisdom so that we can best use this time that we have to get ready to enter our master's happiness. That's my goal. Whatever I do here, it's going to end soon. I want to enter my master's happiness. He's given me some, some stuff. He's given me an allotment according to my ability. I may think he gave me too little. I have to trust he gave me exactly what I need. So I can do his, his job. Because if I'm not focused on that, I'm going to then be covetous. And I'm going to get into all kinds of sins. So I have to respect that, accept that. But God is, look how he is. He's very flexible. He leaves it up to you to manage it, to do with it what you will. But he does expect fruitfulness. That he does expect. Because he wants to welcome you into his happiness. You won't be successful if you're like the guy with one bag of gold who was discontent and disgruntled. Life isn't fair. Oh, you know, people who can, it's very easy to get into that frame of mind. If we're covetous, if we're lazy, if we're judgmental, if we basically just are not accepting the lot God has given us, we're discontent, which leads you to be disgruntled, which in turn is going to lead to a lot of anxiety in your life. There's a day when the master will return. When your time is up, he will settle accounts. How's your account doing right now? Where are you in your accounts? I like to keep a budget. You know, I like to know how my money is coming in. Where is, how much do I have? How much can I spend? You know, I like to have it visualized. I don't know about you, but if I don't know how much I'm going to be spending two months from now, I'll get anxious. I'm a forecaster. Not everybody's a forecaster. That's what we call a forecaster. I want to know how, where are things going to be two, three, four, five months from now, God willing. And if I can try to do that with understanding, I can rest easy right now. I've tried to live both ways. I've tried to live on the fly, you know, not knowing what's coming in. And not knowing what's coming out. And it wasn't, it was too, too anxious for me. I couldn't do it. So I became a forecaster. And I think Jesus is teaching us a principle to live in understanding. By teaching us this parable and many others that talk about making sure we have some sort of accountability. How is your account now? Are you seeing fruit? Are you planting? Are you going out there planting? Have you doubled up two, one bag of gold already? Have you made two, three, half? Are you watering? What are you going to say when the master returns? In John 19, 30, Jesus said, it is finished. Jesus reached a point in time when he said, it's done. Time stopped for me. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He was able to accomplish and finish the work. One day our work will be finished. Our life here will end or Jesus can return. The apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 7, he told Timothy, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. My time for departure is near. He says, I've fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. I think that was a man who was a forecaster. He planned ahead. And he knew what God expected him to do. And therefore, he could say these words in confidence. Because he planted. And because he watered. And because God Gave him the increase and it was obvious to him. He saw it. Are you fighting the good fight? 
Any good fight leaves scars, you know? And if you bear the scars of this good fight, some of you might bear it on your body. Some of you might bear it on your soul and your emotions. Good farmers, you know, they got farmer's hands, rough, weathered, because they're out there working. A good farmer doesn't have soft hands. How are your hands in the work of the gospel? You have any battle wounds in the spiritual war? Because the work is not without suffering. As Moses said, not without moaning. <laughs> It's tough work. But there's also happiness. There's joy. There's bliss. And overall, there's that expectation of when our master will say, come and share in my happiness. I mean, that's what, that's why I'm working. That's why I do what I do. What about you? What are, what is, what do you hope to obtain from this? Where's your goal at? This is the seed right here. The good news. Preaching the good news of Jesus. Go to tell your coworkers. Tell your friends. Tell your family members. Why Jesus came. Why God gave up his son and died for our sins. Tell them why we needed justification. A lot of people think they're good. And we have that million dollar bill, right? We have all those other little tools for evangelism that Fred showed us how to use. That are really great at helping people become self-aware. As Michael was sharing in the Lord's Supper lesson. Aware of that, man, I need to change. Something needs to change because I'm not on my time clock or even my boss's. I'm on God's time. And God has given me something, his wealth, and he's going to settle accounts. And if I'm not ready for that, like Moses said in that song, I'm like a piece of paper in front of a fire. I'm going to be burnt up. I'm going to be consumed by the wrath of God. So teach them. Teach them that Jesus came to give us our righteousness because we don't have any and we need some. And he gave us this righteousness when he died on the cross. And the fact that he rose again indicates that we've been justified for God. Now we're ready for this good fight. And to accept this good news, we become one with Christ. We kind of reenact this good news when we're baptized That's why you got those little blue waves there over the gospel. Because when we're baptized, we join Jesus in his death. And we take on now his righteousness. We're surrendering our life. Because we know God can give us a better one. One that's now equipped to be a planter and a waterer. It doesn't matter what job or career you have. You can be a planter or waterer regardless of what you do. But it's what God expects. And he's going to settle accounts with you one day based on that. That's how we number our days in wisdom and understanding. If all of a sudden Jesus were to appear right now. If all of a sudden, time's up. Stop the clock. Blow the whistle. It's not going to be a whistle. It's actually going to be a trumpet. The Bible describes the last trumpet. One of seven, as the book of Revelation describes. At the sound of the last trumpet, what are you going to be found doing? Are you going to be ready for that day when he will settle accounts? Time will be no more one day. So I invite you all to reconsider. If you haven't been living These days with wisdom and understanding. If you have forgotten on whose time clock you're really on. Well, every first day of the week, thank God, we have a time to reset. <laughs> Isn't that great? You know, some, some uh, sports team wish that they could in the middle of a game do a reset. And they don't get to do that. But every single, not every single week, but every single day, every day that you wake up, the lamentations say, your mercy is new 
every morning. That is such a relief. What a great blessing we've been giving as workers in Christ. That every day, oh man, yesterday, you know, okay, let me really get down to the nuts and bolts today. But don't be delaying. Don't be lazy like that guy with the one bag of gold. Don't be wicked. Take advantage of God's grace. He gives us his grace so that we could give him the glory in the work that we do. So if you've been kind of off lately, you know, you haven't had a good start to the new year. I know I didn't. Come forward. Come and lay down the burdens. Lay down those prayers. And let's gear up and fight the good fight. Because we've got some days to go. We've got some time to go before time is up. Only God knows when that's going to be. And if you're here in our, in our presence today and you haven't yet joined Jesus in baptism and you want to get started on this great work that God has for you, a new life, brand new, clean slate, you've come to the right place. All you got to do is believe and be ready to repent, change your ways so that you can be baptized, have forgiveness of sins and live in newness of life. God bless you. Thank you very much for listening. I hope the Lord gave you insight into conforming to Jesus with today's message. I always appreciate feedback. You can send me your thoughts, musings, and comments directly through the Anchor app. You can also contact me on Twitter at Kingdom underscore Saint. Walk with the Lord today and be a blessing.